everyday injustice. Too many wrongful convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Today on Everyday Injustice, uh, we have family and attorneys for Angelo Quinto. Quinto was tragically killed um, in December of 2020 by Antioch police in another one of these horrible uh, prone restraint holds. We've covered this case almost from the start. Uh, we have attorney Ben Niesebaum uh, from the Burris Law Firm, and we have Robert Collins, the father of Angelo, on. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Hi, David. Good to be here. So the big news this week, of course, is the settlement. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested, Robert, in kind of your reaction to the settlement and also what the thinking of the family was in going through all this. Well, you know, as, as a family member, it's it's hard because it's always it brings up a lot of emotions. Uh, as you realize that the settlement is only there because Angela was killed uh, unjustly and unfairly, and you know, there's just a lot of feelings uh, about it, even though there probably shouldn't be uh, about just closing the case that particular aspect of the case. But I think in a more broad scale, um, when we originally engaged in this, in this lawsuit, the thinking was that we would be able to get a consent decree and get the uh, city of Antioch to um, accede to a number of demands that the family had made. Uh, and moreover, uh, and we have used it in this way, we've uh, used it to try to get additional information through depositions and discovery um, to try to figure out things that on the criminal side, we have not been so successful in getting. Uh, we haven't been successful in getting you know, a good, decent, impartial investigation, for example, from either the Antioch Police Department the sheriff corner, nor the district attorney's office. Um, so, uh, but we have been able to get much of that information through the civil lawsuit uh, in the form of uh, depositions, for example, of the pathologist that conducted Angela's autopsy. And so I'm pleased that uh, that there's a significant number that hopefully makes other uh, cities think about how they need to control their police departments and, and, and make necessary corrections so that they're responsive to the community. And I think for the family, it allows us to focus away from that lawsuit, which, which has served us well in many ways to do things, um, and a way towards uh, continuing the work that we've been doing. Um, now, the other side of this is that we don't need the consent decree because Antioch, the politics in Antioch have really changed, I think, in large part because of Angelo. Um, People that used to be kind of uh, maybe not as explicitly on one side have come to the side of trying to uh, be responsive to the larger community uh, and to take on tough challenges. The police chief has left and we've been through four. The city manager has left. And we have a new set of people running things that I think are more responsive to the community and are looking for ways in which they can improve policing in Antioch. So. That being the major cause of the lawsuit, um, I mean, at least what we thought that we could accomplish with the lawsuit, that being done means that, you know, that it can be closed because we don't need to push Antioch in that way. We can now engage the political process. And, and Ben, can you kind of walk us through for those who are not familiar with this case, kind of in brief, what, what took place in December uh, of 2020? Well, in, a, in very brief detail, uh, what happened was Angelo was having what I've really come to think of as a kind of a very kind of strong anxiety attack. Uh, and he was, he didn't want his family to leave him. He didn't want to be alone. And he would kind of grab a hold uh, when either his sister or his mom walked away. He lived at home with his mom and his sister. And so it was disconcerting and the family did call the police and, uh, you know, they called the police really for help, uh, you know, and the details of that call are, you know, part of the lawsuit, obviously, and they cut both ways, I guess. But what, what it comes down to is when the police arrive, there's nothing that's happening 
that would suggest that Angelo was a threat or a danger or committing a crime or anything like that. They arrive and he's being held, held by his mom, you know, calming him down. And uh, the, the officers don't take him as a threat. They're joking. They come in and, and they talk about, oh, mom is strong to be holding Angelo. And Angelo sees the officers and his immediate reaction to that is yelling out, please don't kill me. And he had a fear of the police and a fear of being killed by the police. And one of the tragic things is that that's exactly what they did. So the, uh, the officers uh, ripped Angelo from his mother's embrace and threw him on the ground and essentially proceeded to conduct a 10 plus minute prone restraint. That's a very long prone restraint. And during that restraint, you know, Cassandra observed officers put their knee against his neck. We have admissions from one of the officers who came into the scene, not one of the initial officers, who, but who came into the, into the room during the restraint, that this very powerful, strong police officer was pressing down on Angelo's back with both his hands while Angelo was handcuffed and was doing that in his presence for a period of at, le of at least two minutes. And it was almost certainly much longer than that. And we know that a couple of ways. One, uh, the when that officer came in the room, uh, the officer pressing down on his back was already doing that. So it had been going on for some period of time before that. And two, Angelo had significant petechial hemorrhages in his eyes, and that's a big deal because that means there's a lot of pressure on his back when he was prone. And every and one of the worst parts of all this, later on, you know, I, I take these officers' depositions, and they and this was around, you know, not long after George Floyd had happened. So, you know, they they even some of them volunteered this in their initial interviews. They said oh, we were certain not to put pressure on his back at all because we were so concerned about uh, about the possibility of asphyxiation because of George Floyd. Well, what did we actually see? So that was kind of an example, as I see it, of a consciousness of guilt. They knew what they had done immediately and were trying to fabricate already at the beginning to say, oh, no, we would not have done that because George Floyd had just happened, so of course we knew better. Well, I had a witness who was one of them who said the exact opposite. And, you know, there are a lot of other evidence in the case, but ultimately, uh, Cassandra at some point started audio recording what was happening because one of the insidious components of asphyxiation is that it doesn't necessarily look like a vicious beating. It doesn't have to be violent or appear violent. And so what you have is a lot of pressure on a person's back. Uh, the person is not in a state of mind where they can speak up for themselves. And so although Cassandra was very concerned at what was happening, kind of because of the culture that she had grown up in and was raised in, didn't want to question police authority to their face. But she did keep making references to, oh, is Angelo asleep? And you hear that on the, uh, on the audio recording. And the officer uh, who's talking to her is telling her, basically, they're having a conversation about mental health. And, uh, you know, there, there are various comments that are made. And then eventually one of the officers says uh, to the other officer, and you hear this on the recording, it's almost like sotto voce voice, we got to get him out of here. And it was our view that they knew that Angelo was suffering at that time, that the police did. And uh, it's almost certain because there was no sound from Angelo during any of that recording, which encompassed the last, starts about about five minutes before the paramedics enter. And right after the, right around the time the officer says that the paramedics come in and the param and they turn Angelo over, or they turn him on his side and they give him a sternum rub. Well, you're only doing that because there's a very, because he's not responsive. And he had no pulse. His uh, face was purple. 
which means that he hadn't been breathing for some period of time. These officers were on top of him, at least one of them was for most of that time, and uh, pressing down on him. The language that uh, one that the officer initially used as, in his interview, the one who saw the officer pressing down, said he walked in and saw that officers were quote unquote on top of Angelo, which should never happen. Angelo was not resisting significantly ever. And so, I mean, ultimately, uh, although they were able to ultimately regain a heartbeat, uh, the brain, Angelo's brain was too damaged by lack of oxygen. And this is what happens in an asphyxiation case that uh, the brain cells are much more sensitive to oxygen deprivation. The heart is not nearly as sensitive, so the heart can get restarted, but the brain dies. And the brain death is a long process that happens over time. But once it starts, you know, it's like a cascade and a chain reaction. And, you know, if it, some people, it, it doesn't go all the way, but with Angelo, unfortunately it did. But it was because of these officers and nothing else. Angelo had no significant drugs in his system. He had modafinil, which has never been known to kill anyone. I tried to bring the the uh, manufacturer of modafinil, an Israeli company, into uh, to defend against their drug being accused of contributing to his death. They resisted that, but ultimately we were able to show. Even the defense uh, toxicologist said, "This is the only case where modafinil has ever been a part of the cause of death." Although he also said the restraint was a part of the cause of death. And didn't they also try to claim uh, excited delirium? That's a whole another ball of wax. Yes, the coroner tried to claim excited delirium. The county coroner, Dr. Ogan, a contract coroner. And, you know, we felt that it was under pressure from law enforcement. Law enforcement was in the room when the autopsy was done. Uh, I mean, and there's, there is a lot of pressure on these coroners who contract and get paid by the government to uh, to come to these conclusions, but that coroner, his he testified in the coroner's inquest that it was excited delirium and said nothing about uh, positional or restrained asphyxiation being involved, and yet in his coroner's report, which the hearing officer at the coroner's inquest had, he said that restrained asphyxiation, quote unquote, may have played a role. Well, it did. And that was somehow kept from the uh, public and the and the uh, the coroner's inquest jury completely, and we have a separate matter in county court trying to uh, vacate those findings. Robert, what what was it like for your family to have to go through this, but to ultimately be able to kind of pull together and and fight uh, all against a lot of odds at this point. Well, David, it's, um, I can tell you that at the very, very beginning, it feels like a Kafkaesque novel. Like I always said, it's a weird position where you're in the hospital and they won't, don't want to let you see Angelo and they don't want to share the records with you and they don't want to give you and they <clears throat> have a felony search warrant and all of a sudden, everything that's been recorded where they said it was a mental health call, all of a sudden, and the, everything's switching and you're in cover-up mode and it's weird to call yourself an american and think you have no rights in this situation and that you're going against a government entity <clears throat> and they've convinced the, the, the hospital staff that they can't talk to you and, and our, the physician would only speak to me in spanish because he was afraid and so you are in this kafkaesque novel and you think you're living in a democracy with civil and human rights and you find yourself in a completely a system that is controlled by a government entity, in this case, the police department at the local level, and you have no rights and you have to start try to exert those rights. And so I think, David, there's there's a lot of stories here. And I think that if you've been used to thinking that you have rights, it's very strange to wake up one day finding out that you have no rights because the opponent is a government. If it had been a private individual, it would have been different, I'm sure. Um, 
So I'm pretty familiar with court process I, and I think in many ways it works well when the two sides are equally powerful. But when one side is the government and you are the other side, I gotta say, one wonders about the constitution. I don't think anything's being followed at this point. Um, having said that, I mean, there's, there's been certainly a, a lot of changes that we've been able to do and find a lot of kindred uh, folks who, uh, you know, from legislators, uh, city council members, um, reporters, um, you know, community members, activists, any number of people who, who think the same way. And, and I think we've been able to achieve putting our story and, and knowing that we came right after George Floyd, you know, I think we've been able to uh, achieve some changes and achieve some significant changes in the political landscape within Antioch. But, um, but ultimately, right, we have a situation where the police department never carried out an investigation. Uh, no one was even looked at for possible discipline. No one was really considered for, for uh, criminal charges because there was never a clean investigation do done by the DA's office. The sheriff corner, entirely as we're seeing, is responsible for basically just covering up with excited delirium the entire thing. We're saying it's a contracted pathologist, but contracted by whom? By the sheriff corner in this county, um, who is uh, leading the charge. So I just don't want to forget that the DA, for example, added fentanyl to the cause to the cause of death, which wasn't done by the pathologist. Fentanyl was given to Angela on a therapeutic level on December 25th at 9.30 p.m. because anyone that gets entubed, again, let's remember, Angelo's eyes never closed. He was never able to breathe again, but they put a tube down his throat to give him air. And anybody that gets that tube normally, is my understanding, gets a small dose of fentanyl. It, it was actually, that's the original use for fentanyl. But the fact that the DA's office has used that to try to smear Angelo and to continue the cover-up um, shows you that for me, there's kind of there's two Americas, right? We have been pretty successful at getting some changes at the le legislative level. But when it comes to the, the ju judicial level and the law enforcement level, you know, this entity is too powerful and it's a career ender for a lot of people. And so at the local level, we couldn't get the police chief to stand up. We couldn't get the sheriff corner to stand up for what is right and truth. We couldn't get the DA uh, to stand up even though she ran under a campaign of being a reformist, et cetera, et cetera. She couldn't stand up, even though we provided her all the evidence. She made it worse. She threw in fentanyl after we met and gave her some feedback. She threw it in. Um, so, uh, so it gives us some hope as a family that we can get some people to listen. We can get some changes. But I got to tell you, I mean, I'm a person, I guess, we, we've had a voice. We've been more privileged than many. I cannot imagine the frustration that families that don't have that privilege would have in this situation. Um, we've had the best lawyers, we've had you know all these things, and still then we can't get a fair shake from this system. So um, David, I just tells you, uh, there's two Americas. There's a privileged America, as usually a white upper middle class, and there's a totally different uh, life uh, and set of rights um, for those that are not deemed to be such. And I think that's the original uh, construct with Angelo. Um, I think if he had not been gauge that some, someone had lacking significant status, um, he wouldn't have been in this situation. You know, if he had been the son of the congressman, man, it would have been an ambulance right away and, and sit down and let's, you know, it will be okay. Um, so the, the problem with it, David, is, is if this was one death and it was such a rare occurrence, but when you're a family impacted, you see that all those people that, that didn't have a voice come to you and they've faced uh, very similar experiences and there's no justice system for them. There's no way to find the truth. There's no way because the DA wants to advance her career and the sheriff wants to remain popular and the police don't wanna show that there's anything wrong with them. And so uh, unless you admit there's a problem, you can't even begin to resolve it. And Ben, you know, Part of the, I mean, there, there are lots of layers to this, as Robert said, but part of what's disturbing to me is twofold. One is kind of the reaction of law enforcement in the moment that they couldn't pull back at any point and go, okay, this guy's in trouble. We, we, we got to change tactics. And then the second part is that even after George Floyd, you guys had to fight for three and a half years to get this thing resolved. Um, and, and, and yeah, we're going to talk about some of the positives in a moment, but uh, I mean, it, it's still, as Robert said, that there's a big problem here. 
It's a massive problem. I mean, we all know it. Anyone I think doing this work knows it. Anyone who has familiarity, you know, frankly with America, they know it, right? It is, you know, the haves and the haves not and the have nots. It is those who have power, those who can control the narrative, uh, they abuse that power. And, you know, we're here fighting against it. We're here trying to demonstrate the reality. And I think this is a case where, and I think publicly we have been able to do that. But if you look at the record, if you look at what goes down on the official record, Angelo's death is still listed as an accident. Uh, you know, it's still listed as excited delirium. I mean, and I have to tell you, I mean, there's a cop who, who was involved in the DA's investigation that I have a history with, you know, going back to very early in my career. And this is maybe the first time that I caught a cop, a cop flat out lying in a police report just flat out lying. And uh, I mean, the, he made a recording of an interview of, of a woman who had been bitten by a police dog in Vallejo. And then he wrote a report and the report was the exact opposite of that recording. And this is an investigator now in the DA's office. Back then he was in the Vallejo Police Department. And now he's part of the team that's, that's investigating this case. I mean, I brought the Vallejo police chief back way back in in 2005 and showed him all this. And you know what he said to me? He said, if you have a problem with this, you can make an internal affairs complaint. Right. I'm like, chief, what are you going to do about it now that I've shown you? He's like, I'm not going to do anything. Well, that was Nicolini. I mean, it is a problem. It's always existed in some ways. There are changes. There are ways that it gets better. But I do think at the end of the day, those changes, you can only heal this through a political process that, that brings you know, accountability politically uh, to those who, who want to lie, who want to cover things up. Fentanyl? I mean, I went back and forth with the, uh, with the DA, the actual district attorney, uh, the assistant district attorney who was responsible for supposedly fixing, <laughs> curing this report. And part of that was fentanyl was in there originally. And I showed him why that was a lie. You know, there's an initial drug screen of Angela when he goes into the hospital, no opiates whatsoever. And I'm like, so clearly fentanyl could not be a contributing factor. That's just a lie. So I thought he understood that, but you know, I knew he wasn't gonna do anything. But he told me they were going to fix the the report and fix the mistakes that were in it. Well, they they fixed it by leaving the fentanyl in, and somehow trying to create the impression that Angelo had taken fentanyl and that contributed to his death. And so I put the suit on blast, and uh, you know went back and forth emailing with him, and I'm like, what the hell is this, you know? And he's like. This, this is unprofessional of you <laughs> to like call him out. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. What's unprofessional is you leaving this in. What, what's your job? Don't you? I mean, where's the integrity? We need actual integrity. I think the scary part of that is, you know, the, the DA is, is relatively progressive as these right. things go. Got, uh, as Robert said, you know, she, she got elected on the idea that she was going to, um, you know, clean up the system, and we're still having this problem. Well, I got to tell you, when I saw that guy's name, the investigator, that he was a part of the team investigating this, I mean, I knew the fix was in. Whether he was going to put the fix in, I'm, I'm not saying he was purposely assigned to it, but him being involved in it, uh, the fix was going to be in as a consequence of him being involved in it. Um, and, you know, to kind of move this back into maybe the more positive light, um, Robert, what do you see as kind of the positive outcomes uh, that have occurred as, as the result of your guys' activism and all the work that you guys have put in for the last three and a half years? 
And David, I'll just take a, an opportunity to say that the settlement of this lawsuit does not is not for us the end. We're just scratching the surface of what needs to be done, and we're committed to continue to to work towards that future. It just means that the civil lawsuit has ended. There's still another lawsuit, and there'll be many more actions. Um, but yeah, thank you. I think there's been a lot of fantastic things accomplished. Um, sometimes we get a lot of credit for them. I don't think it's really our credit. It's you know, hundred people working. It's it's the last straw that broke the camel's back. Sometimes it's post George Floyd and and you know and things weren't cleaned up and we came in and cleaned up things that the where there wasn't the political will at that point and it was just too much when we pointed it out. So for example, the first thing I think that we helped accomplish was getting body and and um, dash cams for the Antioch Police Department. It was one of eight cities in the uh, in, in the state that did not require that of its police department. That was controversial at the time because everyone thought we should just trust them. Uh, now it's not controversial because it's kind of a common sense thing. Everyone else does it. Uh, likewise, Antioch has been very responsive in many ways and tried to do the right thing. They have a non-police, well, mostly non-police, not, not as much as we'd like, but still, it's, a, it's named after Angelo Quinto and it's actually called the Angelo Quinto Community Response Team. And they're coming out. They they did five hundred. Uh, they had five hundred uh, calls a month. I think this past year they had. The, they just passed their one year of being active. And as the mayor said, uh, I think about a week and a half ago at the uh, anniversary event of it, uh, they haven't had an in custody death since uh, that became active. Um, moreover, they did ban the the uh, uh, holds that lead to positional asphyxia at the local level. Now we did go to the state level and also get that banned uh, over there. Um, and there were a number of other more common sense reforms that have happened in, in Antioch. Now, again, this is really the beginning about shifting our expectations and, and trying to make sure that we as a community have control over what happens with policing in Antioch. I think that's one of the biggest things is that the politics have changed, that there's a police oversight uh, body, and that there's an attempt to look for even more ways in which we can have meaningful change and reform in being able to control the police department and to adhere to things. It used to be as a non-charter city, the police department is under the city manager and the city manager was the only person, still is, the only person that can really exert control in a non-charter city of the police department. Everything else is advisory. So when we have a police oversight body, it's really advisory because it is the city manager in the entirety that has control over this. So. Um, I think uh, on a broader scale, looking at those things. At the state level, we, again, were very fortunate that, you know, we've been incredibly fortunate to have a voice. Um, we've been fortunate that the police department came up with three or four different narratives. And so they've contradicted themselves so many times that it's kind of hard to figure out what the original narrative was and which one was right. We did not. And that helped us gain credibility. And that meant that we could help pass AB 490 at the state level. Um, this was in 2021, and it, it bans uh, holds that lead to positional asphyxia throughout California. We are only the second state in the nation to go forward with that. The George Floyd Act, the National George Floyd Act, they kind of took that stuff out. They passed legislation banning chokeholds that was supposed to include that in 2020 after George Floyd's tragic death. But they excluded that at the last second through the POA pressure. Uh, we were able to come back in and, you know, um, basically lend our story to the excluded part and pass that. The second year, we tried again to work with uh, the um, amazing assembly member, Mike Gibson, to pass AB 1608, separating the sheriff and coroner's offices. Um, California is only one of three states that allows the sheriff to be the coroner. 48 counties in California have a sheriff that is a coroner. None of them have a medical degree. We still think that's something that should be changed. The California Sheriff's Association came hard at it, at it on the last vote and defeated us with a bunch of uh, vote no votes uh, from Democrats at the very last bit. So oddly, we're, we're still the 40, you know, we're one of three states that allow that uh, conflict of interest. And there, that's the reason why you had an Antioch officer, police officer or a detective in the autopsy of Angelo's autopsy, having absolutely no transparency and accountability um, or independence. Um, and lastly, we're very proud of the work we've done. And again, you know, we're one of many, but I, again, working with somebody, Mike Gibson, and I think Ben's been amazing with, with Excited Delirium and, and his work on this. 
many other lawyers, Physicians for Human Rights did an amazing report we've been helping with. Um, and all that is to say that um, that California became the first state in the nation, uh, January 1st, to ban that terminology and other term, uh, all other med medically fraudulent terminology to be used by government officials in determining deaths uh, and those kinds of reports. And so, um, you know, it's it's a really interesting window into a level of corruption. This is a term term that's really been um, showcased by Taser International. Now it's called Axion, but they make use of the tasers um, and the various police organizations to try to cover up police related deaths. Almost no, and no, there's almost no accounting for the term being used outside of having a police officer tasing you or asphyxiating you. Like the terminology simply doesn't exist anywhere else unless you go way back in history to the beginnings of it. And so uh, that makes California the first state in the nation to ban the term. Colorado has now followed. Uh, there's legislation in three more states. Um, the UK is considering uh, the uh, issue. So again, it's an incredible insight into a an industry really that is there to cover up police misconduct. And again, from a really basic level, we can't do better. We can't do better if we can't define what the problem is. We can't do better. You know, if we if we really love bus drivers and there was a bus driver that was driving under the influence, it's not good for bus drivers that we cover up the crashes that they have and try to blame it on something else. Likewise, it doesn't help anyone long term to cover up police misconduct. We need to have good management of all systems and have a community that can actually be confident that they can call police uh, and that they won't be discriminated against based upon their perceived social status in our society. So, so anyway, shorthand is it's a, it's a really nice thing to be able to be a part of. Again, it was Andrew's supposed cause of death, um, at least up until the third deposition that the pathologist basically admitted that he was wrong and maybe Ben can elaborate on that, but um, so it's been good to be part of that. I mean, there is a need for common sense reform. There are many people that are uh, incredible with that, um, but we just need to figure out more what we can do with the police um, officers associations, which have been, I think, abusing power. Um, and many of the laws that, that put police above the law. We need to have police officers like all of us. We live in a democracy. We don't have a king. And everyone should be, uh, you know, under the same law. Thank you. And Ben, I, I actually don't like this question, but I have to ask it because so many people ask, uh, you know, when, when these things happen, why is a settlement the right way to approach uh, a case like this? There are so many considerations in terms of going forward and the trial that you face and what you've already accomplished. And I think, you know, this is a case where the defendants, we initially had a, a trial that was set for the fall. It was supposed to be the spring. It got moved to the fall. And then the defendants filed an interlocutory appeal to the Ninth Circuit after qualified immunity was denied to them. And uh, that would have, that put the entire case on hold and there would have been no trial for at least probably close to three years, if not longer. And there's, it's just, there's, that's a long time. And there's a lot, you know, Isabella certainly is quite young. Uh, you know, it, it's a long time for a person's life to be on hold. And so there's a lot of considerations, I think, that, that go into whether or not a settlement is appropriate. And it comes down to, in my view, whether or not you're in a range that ultimately is something that you might see from a trial and uh, among many other factors. And I think just looking at what has been accomplished by the lawsuit itself, there wasn't a whole lot more that could be accomplished other than money, you know, because you have a trial, what's the end result when you win? you get some amount of money. And so that's kind of, I think, uh, one reason why a settlement can make sense. Ultimately, it's about risk management 
And at the end of the day, very few cases actually get tried. Uh, and we've had a lot of good luck in trials, but I've also had luck that was not so good. But I feel like we had, well, who knows how this judge would be, she's new. She didn't necessarily, in my view, uh, we were not happy with uh, her ruling on the summary judgment motion, I'll say that. Um, and, you know, I think that that's an important point that a lot of people just don't understand is that, you know, whether it's a criminal uh, matter or a civil matter, most cases don't go to trial. Very few. And the, and the truth is, you're putting a lot of faith in the hands of strangers, in the hands of people you don't know. And, uh, you know, there's, like I said, uh, we've had good results and results that are not so good, you know? And it's, while we want to believe that a trial ultimately results in the, in the truth being demonstrated, that is not always the case. So, you know, there, there's just cases resolved for a reason. And Robert, as we wrap up here, I mean, from your family's perspective, what is kind of the biggest thing at this point? Well, David, I, I think, um, you know, as, as we're settling this case, there's certainly mixed emotions because people feel like you're going to find truth at the end of a, of a, of a lawsuit. And, you know, and that would have been more the case if we could get a consent decree, if we needed to push Antioch and we needed to take it to the end. Um, but if, if we've gotten the changes in Antioch that we've asked for, and, and on top of that, the city council is willing to work with us on continued changes, um, then we have to emotionally understand that really what we wanted was a criminal case or right? a criminal investigation that would actually find the truth and didn't necessarily think the civil suit would find truth, but only that civil suit could provide an additional push to get a consent decree to get other things established that we ultimately don't need. Um, so as a family, it's this weird thing where you, you know, you still have all these emotions that are mixed in that are not necessarily rational. I mean, it doesn't matter how you look at it. You, you wish that the court would say this is the truth and and these people should be something should happen, you know, but it it really doesn't work like that. But what we found that does work is community. And we found that working with uh, Antic activists and Contra Costa County activists and journalists and the community at large. And, you know, there are so many people that want this to be a better world, that want police departments to treat everyone equally and with respect. And when there's something that goes wrong to actually have a process that's fair, doesn't mean that it doesn't exonerate officers sometimes or, or doesn't, but just a fair process so that people can trust it. And so we're just committed to continuing to see, <clears throat> sorry, what, um, how we can make that better and, and, and feel like we, we have gained a number of things apart from the various local changes and the state law changes and hopefully some influence on the national process is we've gained community and we've learned you know, that there are people that are, there are some people that are trying to defend their career or their position to no end, and they'll do nothing to shake the status quo. But there are so many people that are out there trying to do the right thing and, and they'll join you um, when you can tell that story. And there's other families that need to tell their story. And there's, so I think there's a lot more room here for, for improvement. And I think, um, you know, the excited delirium vote, amazingly enough, Mike Gibson did an amazing job <clears throat> because in our polarized world, there was one dissenting no vote in the entire state legislature. One senator voted no. A couple of them abstained, but basically you had the most amazing piece of legislation leading California to repudiate this misuse of medical science, and you had one no vote. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of positive things that we can hang our hat on and say, these are things we can go forward and try to start figuring out. You know, because it's hard when you're frustrated. You've heard me just in this interview how frustrating it can be when you see the other reality and what people are going through. And the fact that there's two Americas where we believe everyone's created equal or should believe that. Um, but there is hope for change and we're seeing it. And it's incremental and it's not, you know, it's not going to undo policing and all the problems of policing. But 
um, but maybe there's room for things that are significant. And it means joining forces. The other families have been amazing to us. The families of Oscar Grant and Miles Hall and Petey Perez. And I mean, just around us here and, and, and on a bigger level. Um, so everyone's got a similar experience and people have been successful in make it, making changes. And it's a matter of trying to figure out how to work together and support each other and continue to tell a narrative of a better America that doesn't, um, you know, it, it's, uh, we, I think, I think ultimately we all want to see a functioning better America. So the people that are just trying to protect themselves or their job or try to rule with impunity. And we've seen what happened in Antioch after the tech scandal and everything else, it's been a mess. And the, the uh, justice department in there, it's, it's just crazy. Right. So you see where they're defending it. Cause once you get to a point where there's no management and they're getting away with corruption, it's really hard to begin to open up, but we need that opening up, that transparency, so that we can trust policing again. But I, I think there is a there is a way forward here, and we we're committed to have, helping to others and 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 helping to find that. Well, a lot of positives here. Um, I think a good result overall for the family, given everything that you guys have been through. Um, it's frustrating on on a number of levels, but. Uh, you know, getting rid of excited delirium as a possibility in California, I think is a huge win. Um, and, you know, unfortunately there's no shortage of these tragic stories. And I, I'm sure over the last few years, you've met more and more families that are going through the exact same thing. Um, yeah. My heart goes out to you guys. Well, thank you, David. But you know what? It also I wanted to thank you for your coverage from day one. And your continued coverage, I think that uh, that's what you need, right? You need all this. These are complex stories, and so <clears throat> it takes a lot. So, um, you know, that's another part of it. We need to tell our stories when we're victims of it. We need to be uh, not have fear and tell them. And but if everyone helps tell the story, and the legislators help put it together in legislation, and attorneys help fight uh, fight <clears throat> the incredible power the police departments have, then, um, it all comes together and sometimes in some meaningful change. And I think excited delirium is something I, um, uh, I'm very happy about. Yeah. The ending of it. So uh, thank you. All right. We've been talking with, uh, attorney Ben Niestenbaum and, uh, Robert Collins, the father of Angelo Quinto, um, a case that settled this past week. And, uh, you know, there's no such thing as closure, as you just heard in uh, our, our discussion. They have more work they want to do, which I actually think is the best part of all of this. Uh, this has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mousequake Barrett for the use of our opening everyday injustice you can see more of george's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com 